So I'm Jonathan Fried. I'm so I'm from a French National Research Center in Femto ST in Besançon, and I'll be talking about hacking radio frequency spectrum. Basically, I want to introduce you to a few uh, basics about uh, GNU radio, and actually not only uh, only GNU radio as a radio frequency signal processing tool, but basically as a more general framework for getting familiar with uh, digital signal processing and data acquisition. And I really think that it's a nice uh, environment for uh, not only research, but training, uh, education. That's a little bit what I want to show you, that actually GNU radio is much more than just um, signal processing. Uh, but the first question we might ask is, why are we going for digital? I mean, analog radio has been uh, around for ages, and what are the point of getting into uh, digital software? So basically, people started thinking, uh, if you look at the reference in the literature, of going from analog to digital hardware um, at the end of the 50s, basically at the beginning of Apollo program. Apollo was the first uh, airborne system with a fully digital uh, IMU. Uh, before this, the Polaris missile uh, from the Navy were switching from analog to digital IMU. And the reason why in the beginning of the 60s, people decided to go from analog to digital signal processing uh, I've, I've summed up the, the, uh, the three reasons here, is that uh, you have flexibility, basically you build your hardware once and you can just tune whatever algorithm you want on this hardware, so you just bother once with manufacturing the system. Reconfigurability means that once you have designed your system, you can change parameters as your missile or your uh, plane is flying. Uh, in my case, when you switch on an atomic clock, you want a startup phase, and then you want a running phase, and these parameters might not be the same. So reconfigurability means that you can change the parameters, which you can hardly do with analog feedback control. And finally, reproducibility means that your uh, analog components are not going to age over time. If you have a capacitor or resistor-based feedback control, these components are going to age, the value of these components are going to change with temperature or with capacitance or with uh, moisture levels. This is not going to happen with digital hardware. Digital hardware will always make the same computation. Same input means same output. So reproducibility is really an important aspect because you can predict how accurate your uh, calculation will be. So basically the paradigm since basically end of the 60s is to a bit shift from hardware to software uh, in general, and I want to show you in, in this particular case of radio frequency signal how this paradigm change is, is now reaching the, the general public. Now, you should be aware that I'm not going to claim that digital processing can do everything that analog processing can do. There is still a lot of fields where only analog processing can go, and basically baseband radio frequency signal processing can only be done using uh, analog hardware like acoustic wave filters, correlators. These are things that nowadays uh, digital chips available to the general public will not perform multi-giga sample per second operations. Uh, these are still limited to um, analog uh, components, but I want to show you nevertheless that there are quite a few things that you can do. Now, I've been very much inspired by a website by people who have written a book about a GPS and Galileo, um, uh, digital-based uh, global navigation satellite system receivers, uh, people from uh, uh, Denmark, I believe, and what they have on their web page is this uh, graph, view graph, where they explain that uh, originally the hardware receiver, sorry, the radio frequency receiver was whole hardware. That's your old 70s and 80s radio frequency receiver where you would have AM, uh, FM demodulator. And if you wanted to go for digital or another mode, basically you just have to change uh, and uh, buy a new radio. The dream of software-defined radio is to get rid of all this hardware, all this dedicated hardware. Now, at some point, you still have an analog signal which is flying over the ether, which is radio frequency wave. And the first step you want to get is analog to digital conversion to, to convert this radio frequency signal into an analog signal that's going to be processed, and everything you want to be in software. Now, nowadays, with current A to D converters, which can run easily up to 100, a few hundred megahertz sample per second, this is something that you will do in the HF band. So let's say in the 0 to 30 megahertz band, this dream has become true. You can sample base band, a 30 megahertz signal, and basically process the whole band. In UHF, VHF, so 30 megahertz up to 3 gigahertz, this is just physically impossible. 
nowadays, general purpose A2D converters just don't have a bandwidth for baseband processing at such a high frequency range. So what we're going to actually use in the real world is a mix of a, a limited hardware front end where your low noise amplifier and mixer is going to something I, I will be defining in the next slide. So basically, you want a very basic hardware, general purpose hardware, which is not going to limit uh, your capability to process data, but once you have moved your signal from a baseband frequency to a frequency range or sample rate that is manageable by software, then you're going to process everything by software. So nowadays we're at this stage, and what I'm going to show you is that you can get such hardware for a very reasonable price. Just to make sure that everyone is on the same basic, I'm sorry for people who are doing signal processing, I'm sorry for radio amateur, this is already obvious for you, but just to make sure that everyone is clear about things, there is the, the crucial part of this mixing part about frequency transposition is the mixer. So let me just remind you a core aspect of radio frequency signal processing, which is this mixing component here, which takes well, a radio frequency input, a local oscillator input, so these are two sine waves, and we're going to generate an intermediate frequency. And the, 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 the core mathematical uh, relationship is that if you have a product, so a, a nonlinear function, of a product of two cosine functions, you will generate the subtraction and the addition of these two uh, attributes. And if you do this, not with constant values, but with a sine wave, so cosine of a first frequency times cosine of a second frequency, what you see here is that you're going to get the subtraction of these two sine waves and a uh, frequency and the addition. So basically by having two frequencies, F1 and F2, if you run a local oscillator, F1, a frequency, radio frequency, F2, you're going to generate two signals, F1, F2, F2 minus F1 and F2 plus F1. And if you do this with F1 close to F2, if you bring F1 close to F2, you're going to generate two sine waves, one which is very high frequency, which we're going to red get rid of by low pass filtering, and one which is close to the carrier. And if you have an A to D converter with a low bandwidth, low meaning something like in the 100 megahertz range or tens of megahertz range, then you can have a low pass filter which is going to get rid of all these arrays and you only keep your F1 minus F2 and this is what is called frequency transposition and this is what the mixer is doing. And this, this aspect of signal processing is actually what is used in the hardware I want to discuss with you today, which is digital video broadcast receivers. There's been a lot of fuss, and I should really emphasize that I'm certainly not the best person here to talk to you about this, because I have not been a developer about this project. I've just downloaded the source code on the website and been using it. But there's been a lot of fuss for the last two, two and a half years about these digital, digital video broadcast TV receivers. Uh, which are sold on the on the web, actually, that are sold simply uh, for about 25, 30 euros. And what I want to show you here is that for 30 euro, you can get introduced to radio frequency reception using the new radio environments. So I'm not going to give you any trend of uh, one of these DZ DVB receivers. The only thing that you have to look at is the chipset these support, uh, supported by these uh, digital, digital video broadcast receivers. So you have one chipset, which is an uh, analog front end, which is this frequency transposition I just mentioned to you, which is basically two mixers. You have your radio frequency signal, which is what you want to measure. You have a local oscillator, which is something that's tunable, software tunable. And this local oscillator will allow you to bring your radio frequency signal into the frequency band that is accessible to the A to D converter, which is con included in the Realtek RTL2832. Now, the, the hardware properties of this RTL2832 is that it's 2.8 megahertz bandwidth. So your sampling rate is about 3 megabit per second, 3 megahertz. And you must bring your local oscillator within 3 megahertz of your radio frequency signal in order to be able to process it. So this is the basic uh, core aspect of, of zero intermediate frequency, zero IF receivers, where you just take a radio, radio frequency signal, transpose it into a frequency band, which is accessible to A to D converter by mixing and low pass filtering. And because a radio frequency signal is defined by two quantities, its magnitude and its phase, you cannot just make a single mixing step, because otherwise, if you have just a uh, sign of the difference of your two frequencies, if a phase between the two signals happens to be uh, zero, then your sine wave will, your sine will always be zero. So you need the two components, the quadrature component and the identity components, where you mix by two uh, 
phase shifted versions of the local oscillator by 90 degrees. This is all very well known for radio frequency uh, signal processing people, and this is what is included in hardware in these components. That was just the basic introduction about digital video broadcast uh, receiver processing for software defined radio. So this chip here, which I should um, just bear with me for a second, so I yeah. So this, what I'm talking to you about is, is this little chip here. So thi these, these dongles that you're going to buy for about 25 euros, they give you the, the basic uh, information about uh, the basic hardware for getting introduced to, to software uh, defined radio. And the environment, the, the environment for running this hardware will be GNU Radio. So what is GNU Radio? Great, GNU Radio is actually a framework which allows you to assemble various signal processing blocks. So you have three main blocks. You have ob obviously input. The, the signal input is what signal you're going to feed. So the, the digital video broadcast dongle is one possible source of signal. The sound card is another one. I'm going to give you an example of how to use the sound card as a signal processing input. And you've got a whole range of hardware which is sold by a company called Etus Research which are the universal software radio peripheral, USRP. You have a whole range of hardware which costs about 500 to 600 euros. So depending on how uh, motivated you are, you can get started with your sound card, which doesn't cost anything because you all have them on your computer. You keep on going with your digital video broadcast receiver like this one. And at the end of the day, you just, if you're really interested, you buy one of these USRP with an increase about tenfold of uh, bandwidth in, in each case. So you go from 100 kilohertz to about 3 megabit per second, and then you go to 64 megabit per second. So you have an improvement of, of the frequency band. Then you have all the processing blocks. That will be the core aspect of my discussion in the next 50 minutes or 45 minutes. And then you have the output. So an output might be a file, might be an audio stream, as we are going to see next. We can just listen to the radio. That's what you expect from a radio receiver. Uh, you can have an oscilloscope output. We can have a, a frequency synthesizer that is going to generate a radio frequency signal. So there's a whole range of things that you can do. But the basic flowchart of data processing is input, processing, and output. Uh, and these are all blocks that are provided by new radio. So it's really a, a general purpose uh, framework. Uh, basically, the, the message I want to get to you is that you should not limit yourself to the input and output uh, uh, peripherals that are provided by new radio, because being an open source project, you can just write your own blocks. And if the peripheral that's uh, provided by new radio does not fit your needs, then just add whatever functionalities you want. It's really easy to do. Just a quick reminder uh, about signal processing basics. You might think, hey, great, I can get a 3 megabit per second A to D converter, so why am I going to use my old sound card, which is only 96 uh, uh, kilohertz uh, bandwidth? Just a quick reminder is that um, in order to gain one bit of resolution, if you want to do subsampling, or sorry, oversampling, so maybe basically averaging multiple samples, you need to increase four times the sampling rate to gain one bit. Four times because your noise level is decreased by the square root of a number of, of, a, of a frequency increase. And basically, one bit multiplied by two, square root, uh, square root of four is two. So you need to multiply by four the sampling rate. And this means that if you compare the resolution of your 2.8 megabit per second dongle with the fr uh, sampling rate of a sound card, you will see that the eight bit this, this thing here is an 8-bit A2D converter. If you think of it uh, by oversampling and you go back to the sampling rate of a sound card, that would mean that you only gain 2.5 bits. So what I want to tell you here is that don't take this as a high-resolution sound card because by oversampling using an 8-bit digital video broadcast receiver, you only get 2.5 bits. And 8 plus 2.5 means you have a 10-bit sound card, which is a very crappy sound card. So if you can live with low bandwidth, high resolution, go for the sound card. If you need the bandwidth, go for the digital video broadcast receivers. It's not a matter of binary decision. It's to read what kind of objective you you're, you're want to reach. Frequency range this dongle is operating in is 50 megahertz up to 2.2 gigahertz with some, some, some holes in there. But basically, 50 megahertz to 2.2 gigahertz. And then if you want to make a wideband FM receiver, again, you take your new radio, uh, 
uh, graphical environment, you have the source here, which is this data stream from the A to D converter. This data stream is low passed in order to decimate the data flow because here you have 2.8 megabit per second. That's a little bit megabyte per second. That's a little bit too much for most computers, especially for my old computer. So the first thing you and anyway, you don't need 2.8 megabyte per second to process wideband FM uh, modulation, which is only 250 kilohertz wide. So the first thing you do is you take your data source, you decimate the data using a low pass filter. So basically, you get rid of one of every 16 sample, and then you just implement the wideband FM receiver block from new radio. And I, I'll end up falling. And at the end, at the output of this receiver, you just send the output to the audio sync and you have your sound if everything operates properly. So it's really a matter of four block assembly to get a wideband FM receiver. And here you have a whole list of the functions that are provided by GNU Radio. So basically, you have a, a graphical environment, GNU Radio Companion, that helps you select all these blocks, these processing blocks, the sources, the syncs, uh, synchronization blocks, digital modulation blocks. You basically, all this kind of stuff is going to help you get started with software-defined radio. And what you were supposed to do to see is I've also added on my uh, wideband FM receiver block, I've added the Fourier transform sync graphical user interface, and the Fourier transform sync basically gives you the Fourier transform of your frequency band from 104.7 megahertz. This is 10 minutes ago what the guys from the ra FM radio uh, emitter were generating, and you tune your frequency range, uh, radio frequency gain, and you see nicely that there is only one emitter around here, and that's the guys from the FM radio emitter. So that really helps you finding where your signal source is. Uh, the beauty of digital signal processing and, and, and flexible hardware is that you can just do anything you want. So this is something I've stolen from the web from the guy who has been doing on the re repository of new radio uh, project, the radio data system acquisition, the RDS system. And what you can see here is that this guy has been doing a very fancy assembly of blocks. But the end of the, 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 end of the story is that he's able to receive the analog signals so of the sound of your broadcast, FM broadcast, and at the same time, he's receiving all these messages that you see in your car radio that tell you what kind of channel you're tuned in, what kind of uh, program is being broadcasted. So the beauty of, of software-defined radio is that you're not changing anything to the hardware, you're just adding more processing blocks, and suddenly you get from basic sound card, uh, sorry, uh, sound or music coming out of your radio, you add the digital functionality. So this is the kind of output that you would be getting by running the RDS functionality that is provided on the new radio uh, website. Um, now, this is all user stuff, and you're not interested, or at least I'm not interested, I believe you're not either, in just using, you want your developers, you want to add your functionalities, using is just fun for the first 10 minutes, and then you want to add your own blocks that are not available in new radio. And of course, uh, new radio be being open source, the only thing that you're encouraged to do is read, a read the existing block source code and just modify them or add your own functionalities based on what these guys have been doing. So one example here, and what you again you cannot see, is that I've got my digital video broadcast dongle over here connected to the computer. I've got uh, a modem, a radio modem. This is uh, a frequency shift keying, FSK modulated radio modem, the kind of little thing that you buy for nothing that are going to open your car. There's uh, remote keyless entry systems. And when you switch on this modem and you feed the wideband FM receiver function of new radio, you see here hardly these peaks going up and down, these are bits. So basically what FSK is doing is it encodes each bit in a different frequency. And when you feed a wideband FM receiver with these varying frequencies, it's like in the analog version where your phase locked loop uh, of the uh, FM receiver kept on jumping from one bit to another. Here you get the digital version of a phase locked loop going at two levels, uh, which are the two frequencies encoding the bits. And these are basically what I've written here is because I know that my radio modem here is communicating at 4,800 bit per second, I just have to sample every 1 over 4,800 seconds the, the value of this bit stream, and I can decode uh, a stream of data. And what's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but these are the sentences I have been emitting. So this is what I've been programming my radio modem to send. 
These are the sentences that I have received using my very basic decoder, which is, again, just a threshold detection. I'm just putting a threshold here. If it's over, it's a 1. If it's below, it's a 0. And this is a very simple decoder. And what you see here is that you've got all the header of this communication. So you've got a lot of crap uh, with an address, with a synchronization stream, this kind of stuff. And at the end, you got the message. And if you look closely at the slides, if you want to take a copy, I'll, I'll remind you at the end of the talk where you can, you can get the slides. If you look carefully, you will find all the sentences that I have sent. You will find then again the receiver. So basically, again, with about 10 lines of code and using the new radio functionalities, you can write your own uh, digital mode decoder. So what I want to introduce now to is how did I address the problem of writing my own decoding software. The way I work, I'm not saying it's the right way, I'm just saying it's my way of, of doing things. The way I'm doing things is I first record files of the data I want to process. So basically these are sound files or binary files with sequences of uh, acquisition from my uh, dongle. B this allows me to run my decoding software without having to wait for the event that I want to decode uh, to, to occur. And the event I'm going to be interested in, what I'm going to show you next, is uh, one by, uh, protocol I've been interested in for a long time. It's called ACARS. ACARS is a b digital protocol used by planes to communicate with airports. Basically, it's a general purpose uh, information. It's nothing confidential. It's basically level of fuel, weight of a plane, uh, basic information such as uh, we have a sick passenger or you'll see some other stuff. So ACARS is a digital protocol used in uh, airplanes to communicate with uh, uh, airport. And of course, if you want to make an ACARS decoder, you need a plane to be over your place to listen to something. And that's very annoying because when you want to debug something, you don't want to, p to wait for a plane to come. So you record a few uh, signals, then you prototype your decoding algorithm. And being a serial processing person, I'm most familiar with MATLAB or its open source version, which is New Octave. If people are familiar with Python, uh, Python has now implemented most of the MATLAB functionalities and numerical Python and scientific Python, NumPy and SciP. So if you're familiar with Python, Python is very nice because your blocks that you write in Python are mostly compatible with New Radio. So you prototype first using a scripting language such as New Octav or Python. Then you transpose from this interpreted script into a compiled C program. And that takes some time because uh, a single line of MATLAB can be many, many lines of, of C. And at the end of the day, you just wrap this C program into the GNU Radio framework, which is really nothing much. This is really just copy-pasting copy, copy a few lines from, from, a, from a basic block. So this is the, 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 the flowchart that I'm thinking of, is record some data. This is offline processing using uh, MATLAB or Octave, converting to C in order to fit the new radio framework, and by this you go from offline processing to inline processing and real-time processing, which is much more fun. So let me just introduce to, look to you quickly what ACARS is about. ACARS, as all plane-related uh, modulation protocols, pr modulations, is amplitude modulated. Uh, being most resistant to, to noise. So you have AM modulated, so we are going to run our data stream through the AM demodulation block from New Radio. And then what you learn from the web, and I've put for you here the, the references that I've been using for ACAR's uh, uh, information, you have uh, encoding at 1,200 bits uh, a hertz sine wave encoding a zero, 2400 encodes a one, and you have communication, data communication at 2400 bits per second. So let's first think of this. That's really funny because at, at the first time you read the, the, the manual, you're thinking, that's funny, why did they do this? They encode at 1200, 2400, there's a ratio of one to two here, and then they have a data rate of 2400, which is my fastest data rate. That's really funny, why did they do this? The answer will be in the next slide. Then you know that you have a header, which is used to, to tune the automatic gain control of the error front end. And then once you have your bits, you learn that a zero, a bit zero, means that the bit value is unchanged, and a bit of one means that a bit value is changed. And if someone can explain to me why people are using this funny way of encoding, I would be really be interested because I don't understand it. Um, so they don't encode the bit value, but they encode the bit change value. 
And at the end of the day, what I want to reach so that you know what my final goal is, my final goal is to be able to, using new radio, to receive a car's sentences. A car's sentences record two times of information, the flight number and the plane identity. From the plane identity, I can go on the plane spotter website and I can have a picture of a plane and who is operating the plane, which company. And from the plane, uh, from the flight information, I go, on the, I go on the virtual radar website and I can check whether over my city this plane is indeed flying. So that was my purpose, to have the plane and flight information so that I can recover this information from the web. So um, how do you get this going? Just a quick answer, why have people done this 1,200 bits uh, hertz encoding and 2,400? The story is very simple. If you have one bit here, which is encoded as either one full period or as a half period of the encoding signal, what you can see is that when you're going to do a convolution uh, of this uh, message that you're getting with either this sine wave or this sine wave, because here you have an even... An odd function, and here you have an even function, the product of an even by an odd function will obviously have an integral which is no, and otherwise if you have even times even, you have one half as an integral, or odd times odd will give you a one half. So I've written for you here the three, ca the three possible cases. You have an unknown signal which is either one of these two cases, you make a convolution with these two functions, and you get one half if you have a right version of the bit and you have zero otherwise. So it's a very efficient way of computing your convolution and getting the right value. So what we're going to do is going to convolve the signal that you receive from the A to D converter. And we know that convolution is very inefficient in the uh, time domain, especially on, 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 on sequential CPU. So we're going to use a frequency domain. So we will need some Fourier transform. And this is where MATLAB is most efficient. So what you get at the end of the day is you take your data stream. What you cannot see on this black and white graph is that there are two uh, sets of data here. You have the 2,400 hertz bit uh, decoding. You have the 1,200 hertz decoding. And what you would be seeing if you had this in color is that you have initially the 2,400 hertz, which is the most probable value of the bits. And then at some point, these values curves cross, meaning that one bit value is more probable than the other one. And that gives you your data stream. So basically, you will have a full stream of one, then a zero, then a full stream of one, and so on. So basically, get the bit values is just a matter of convolution. Now there is just one more trick here is that a bit is given by a given number of samples. And the, the little hint I want to give you here is how the GNU radio is going to give you an asynchronous chunk of data of unknown size. So sometimes it will give you a few hundred bytes, sometimes it will give you a few thousand bytes. How do you process a Fourier transform which requires a, mi a, a minimum number of values to perform this, this, this operation. And what we've been doing, assume that in your buffer, in your data buffer, your Fourier transform is going to operate on a given number of samples. And at first, you only get a tiny chunk of data, not enough to make your Fourier transform. What we're doing is we are accumulating data until the full chunk of Fourier transform data has been accumulated. Then we're going to process this amount of data and provide the user with whatever result is uh, achieved. And whatever is left, so this little chunk of data here that we have not yet processed, we're going to put it in the beginning of the buffer and we start accumulating values again and again until we have enough data to make a new Fourier transform. So this is a little bit of a trick here that we had to solve in order to, because GNU Radio is not giving you a finite number of data, you never know beforehand how many data you're going to get and you need to accumulate enough uh, uh, values to run your, your, your processing uh, function. I'm not going to get into much detail about the, the code source. This you can find, again, this is more for reference for you. If you want to, to fetch my slides on the, on the website, which I'm going to remind you at the end of the, of the talk, you can just fetch the data, and this is going to give you examples. So basically, in the GNU Radio Companion graphical interface, you have an XML file, and the XML defines what kind of input, what kind of output, so whether you have uh, short char characters, integers, floating point numbers, how many inputs, how many outputs, and you can provide parameters. So you have dynamic parameter in your block and you can provide your block with dynamic parameters, not only uh, fixed parameters in, in your software. So you have an XML files which define 
the how, your, how your blob behaves, you have a C implementation of your algorithm. And this is what I was saying, that uh, going from the MATLAB implementation to the C implementation is not completely uh, trivial, especially when you have the FFT function. You do have the FFTW uh, library. And going from FFT in MATLAB to FFTW in C requires tweaking with normalization factor. Your, your threshold values are no longer the same. It does take time. But at the end of the day, you have a C function which implements your uh, algorithm. And uh, having done so, you have your whole processing sequence. Your processing sequence for ACARS is we first search for each data set we're accumulating. We accumulate enough data to make sure that we have a whole sentence. So a whole sentence is defined by the protocol as 300 characters. So we're going to accumulate enough data to have at most 300 characters. In this data, we're going to search for 13 periods of 2,400 hertz sine wave just by doing a Fourier transform convolution with this signal here. If we find something that's above a given threshold, and our algorithm is very dependent on this threshold value, that's, that's the drawback. If we find a, a value above threshold, we know that a message has been sent by a plane. By doing so, we know that we are going to start a convolution at the beginning of this message in order to search for the 2,400 and 1,200 hertz sine waves, which are going to tell us whether we have one or bits one or bit zero. So we identify the most probable bit value. And having done so, uh, we extract the bit sequence. From the bit sequence, we generate the byte sequence. As I told you before, uh, zero means a bit change. One bit means no bit change. So if, uh, if you have a single error, then your whole stream is erroneous. And at the end of the day, you interpret all this data as flight number, uh, plane number, plane identification, and so on. And at the end of the day, what you get is a whole stream of hexadecimal values, which are displayed as the decoded bytes. These bytes are interpreted as sentences, and it makes your wait in airports much more uh, uh, play playful when you are at the airport and just listening at all the sentences sent by the plane, which are waiting on, on the to, to, to take off. So this is basically what I wanted to show you about ACARS decoding. New Radio ACARS development, you can find uh, on the CGRAN website under ACARS uh, the, the implementation of this, and I hope someone wants to play with it. At the moment, it's only been validated with a DVB receiver. So this is all working pretty well, and uh, what I would like you is, is to play with this software to, to, to learn how to implement your own functionalities. This is all reception. Reception is only half of, it, of, uh, of the game. You also want to emit something. Emitting is, is really the fun part. So before emitting, the first thing I want to tell you is new radio is full duplex. Full duplex means that you can receive at the same time you're emitting. And this is great fun, because if we're working with sound cards, full duplex means that you can play and receive at the same time. And if you're familiar with what this is, you can make a net, uh, an audio frequency network analyzer. A network analyzer is something that is going to generate a sine wave of varying frequency. And we're going to look at the response of our whatever device at this uh, excitation signal, which is a variable sine wave. And Basically, what I want to show you here is that there is no really nothing to do if you want to convert your computer with its sound card into an audio frequency network analyzer. You just play a sine wave. At the same time, you receive the stream. And the only little trick here is that you need to get the magnitude of a signal. And to get the magnitude, the first thing you can do is you just take a diode. So what I want to use this for is you, you might all be familiar with a tuning fork. This coarse tuning fork is what you all have in your watches. This is the timing function of your watch. This is actually what you have in your watch. It's a 3, mm, three millimeter diameter, 8 millimeter long tuning fork made of quartz. When you generate a sine wave, it will start moving, and it is dimension so that it moves at exactly 32,768 kilohertz or 2 to the 5 kilohertz. And if I take this tuning fork and I generate a sine wave at 32, sevens, at 32 kilohertz dot something and I look at the output of a diode, what you will see here is that you see here these jumps and this is the response of my uh, tuning fork. So I'm sweeping the frequency range. And when my, my frequency is going over 32768, I have current going through my tuning fork. And this indicates that I'm at resonance. So basically, with no equipment at all, you can make a, 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 an audio frequency network analyzer. And if you really want to have nothing at all as hardware, you get rid of the diode. Uh, so the rectifying diode, and what I wanted to show you here, but it's really un unreadable, 
is that we implemented IQ demodulation. So IQ demodulation is what I've shown you earlier. You do a mixing, but again, you do a mixing of the sine wave that is generated through the tuning fork. So you generate 32,768 hertz. You have a local oscillator, which is tuned at the same frequency as, uh, that you're emitting. And what you can see here is the magnitude of the signal going through the tuning fork. And uh, the red curve here is the phase going through the tuning fork. So we have validated that software implementation of IQ, IQ demodulator is indeed working. And just the little trick here, and again, this is the beauty of open source, is if you stupidly do, as I did, cosine of frequency time times your time, since your time is slowly drifting over time as, as uh, steps are incrementing, this thing will quickly diverge. And cosine of a diverging function is not a good idea to compute. And so if you get inspiration of the implementation of a numerically controlled oscillator as done in GNU Radio, you learn that at each step you increment a phase value by 2 pi times the wanted frequency divided by the sampling frequency. You normalize by 2 pi, so you keep this argument between 0 and 2 pi, and this is where you know that you can compute a cosine. So Without getting into the details, again, the beauty of open source software, if I need to convince anyone about it, is that when you're doing something wrong, you can learn how people have been doing it right and just learn from, what, from your mistake and what, from what they're doing. So this is uh, IQ uh, demodulator implementation, and we've, we've been using this for quite a few audio frequency signals. And what I'm interested in is using the tuning fork, the quark tuning fork as a sensor. So what's happening here is that when I'm uh, hitting my tuning fork, I can detect the frequency change, the resonance frequency change. So this is all a lot of fun and, and with really no hardware at all, nothing else but a sound card and an open tuning fork. The last thing I wanted to get in, uh, sorry, uh, frequency counters, I'm going to, to skip this one. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, in the last 10 minutes is radar. I've just talked to you about emitting signals, but I'm talking to you about emitting signals in the audio frequency range. And this is a talk about new radio. So maybe you people would like to know how to make a radar system out of new radio. The most common aspect that we're all familiar with of radar is we generate short pulse what is called pulse radar. We generate short pulses of high energy uh, which are going to be reflected by the target and the target uh, sends back a high bandwidth, meaning a very short pulse, and we need very fast hardware to sample this high bandwidth. It's feasible, of course, a lot of people do it, but it's not amateur grade. There's no way you're going to make a high bandwidth receiver for a pulse mode radar. And you have a very beautiful uh, other approach, which, which is called FMCW, Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave Radar. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about. And sh I should emphasize here, because I don't have enough space on the next slide, this is all inspired by the MIT websites. You have, again on my slides, the exact references for the last two years or so, MIT has been promoting a course on radar systems where they have an amazing um, uh, lab uh, description on their open course web, uh, website. And really, I encourage you to go and copy what they did. It's 100 euro worth of equipment, and you learn how to make a 2.4 gigahertz radar. So what I want to introduce, I want to remind you how a FMCW radar works. The principle of an FMCW radar is you have a voltage-controlled oscillator. That's a 20 euro uh, uh, piece of equipment. You have a, vo uh, 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 a voltage-controlled oscillator is an oscillator whose output frequency is defined by a tuning voltage. This voltage-controlled oscillator is going for a power amplifier because you need a bit of power, but I'm not talking about the same kind of power as earlier. Earlier, we were talking about kilowatt power. Here, we're talking about milliwatt power. This signal here is going to get from an antenna and travel over time to, um, to a target. So your oscillator here is tuned by a sine wave, uh, sorry, a triangle wave. So this means that your voltage controlled oscillator frequency is changing over time. What I've plotted for you here is the frequency of the voltage controlled oscillator as a function of time. And you see that this frequency here is moving as a triangle wave. And because this voltage-controlled oscillator is moving over time, when the reflected signal from my target arrives to my receiving antenna as it amplified, the mixing step here, and I remem remind remember that the mixing will make a subtraction between the received frequency and the emitted frequency, because over this time, dt, the frequency has changed a little bit, then there is going to be a bit frequency generated here. Basically, you have here an image of what the 
voltage controlled oscillator was dt times before the reception of this echo. So an FMCW radar is really three components, a voltage controlled oscillator, amplifiers, and a mixer. You need three components to make an FMCW radar, and the MIT website shows you what the component values are, and it's 100 euro worth of components. You have a few free parameters, but basically what you have to remember is that the only bandwidth that is needed to process FMCW radar is audio frequency signal. Even though you're measuring high bandwidth signal, I should emphasize this VCO here is a 2.4 gigahertz VCO. So this is allowed. You're allowed to emit on the 2.4 gigahertz, that's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all these uh, digital modes. So this is a 2.4 gigahertz signal, but after this mixing step, you only get audio frequency bit signal. And this is really easy for you to sample using your sound card or one of these digital video broadcast receivers and process the data with new radio. And what I'm claiming as a novelty of my approach with respect to the MIT website is the MIT website is recording this audio frequency and post-processing in a MATLAB, which is excellent for teaching. I have no problem about this. But in my case, by running the same software under new radio, I have real-time display of my target position. So what you cannot see on this slide is that basically this is all assembly, this is Lego-like. We had a presentation about Lego Mindstorm. Basically, radio frequency uh, prototyping is also Lego, except that it's a bit more fancy Legos and a bit more expensive Legos. But again, this is a whole 100 euro experiment. And what I want you to see here, if you just look at this half of the graph, you have eight peaks that you can hardly see on this, on this uh, projector. But these eight peaks are the eight targets that I've located behind my FMCW radar. And again, I want to emphasize the beauty of the new radio approach is that these peaks, you see them appearing in real time. You don't need to post-process and run some fancy algorithm. You just have a free transform of the sound card input here, and you see these eight peaks appear. And if I remove my targets from my FMCW radar, these peaks are just going to disappear. Let me just add that actually these peaks are not due to passive um, targets, but this is what is called surface acoustic wave delay lines. These are basically target simulators where the delay here is from one to four microseconds, but they are not due to targets located 150 meters away, but they are due to a specific component made of piezoelectric substrate where the time delay here is due to a tiny component here which simulates a target, which is one to four microseconds away. I've been trying to find secondhand sources of these components, and unfortunately, I don't have been able to find any cheap secondhand sources to advise you to buy from. But if, you want, if you're interested in these applications, uh, you might come and see me, and I might have a few hints as how you I might get, be able to get some of these components. So <coughs> again, at the end of the day, what does all this look like? You have these eight peaks here from your eight targets that are measured by the FNCW radar. And in terms of new radio development, it's just a few blocks that you just put together. The sine wave that generates for the audio uh, output, the, the triangular wave, uh, sorry, the triangular wave through the audio sound card that is going to tune your VCO. And at the receiver side, you acquire what is coming out of your mixer, fully transform, and out of your fully transform, during the averaging, you see these peaks appearing. So. Again, the beauty of this whole thing is that you're generating a 2.4 gigahertz radar with a receiver side, which is only audio frequency bandwidth signal. So, so that's really beautiful. And then it brings me to my conclusion about what I wanted to show you with this new radio stuff. You have an open source environment, which really eases the entry to software, uh, software defined radio processing. Basically, I believe that new radio is a beautiful environment for training, for teaching, because you just get rid of all these oscilloscopes, these function generators, without getting to these ridiculous Java-based applets where you make students believe that they're making a lab, but they're actually not doing anything because they're just clicking on buttons. With software-defined radios, you still have some hardware, but you're doing digital signal processing. You have reusable software, meaning that all these blocks that you've been writing for new radio will be reusable, whatever source and whatever sync you're writing. <coughs> And because this is open source software, you're encouraged to add any source or sync that you might uh, suit your needs. So that's the uh, mo radio modem, that's DDS, direct digital synthesizer, all these kind of sources that are now available and that, and very, which are really cheap to, to, to use. <coughs> uh, you might get started with graphical user interface, as I've shown in my presentation with New Radio Companion. And 
this is all about, <coughs> and actually what New Radio Companion is doing is generating a Python script. If you get more familiar with the whole processing chain, then you stop using the New Radio Companion environment and you just write your own uh, Python uh, uh, programs for generating New Radio processing uh, chains. And what I wanted to show you in this presentation is how I imagine that the workflow is most efficient. <coughs> You record data, you process your data under MATLAB, uh, New Octave, whatever scripting uh, tool you're familiar with, convert the script into C, and wrap the C software into new radio environment for inline processing. Further work, there are amazing stuff on the, on the web, which I have unfortunately not been able to reproduce for you for today's presentation. The first thing is NOAA weather satellite. I think a lot of you people know about the low frequency 137 megahertz weather satellites, really easy to catch. Some people on the web, reference number 11 here, have shown that this digital video broadcast TV receiver can get signals from satellites 800 kilometers away. This is just amazing. I've, just, I've not been able to reproduce. I can get the sound of a satellite. When I decode the sound that I receive, I don't get an image. So I'm still doing something wrong. But this is really very simple. And there's another amazing stuff from, I believe, University of Catalonia in Barcelona. They've, these people have demonstrated raw GPS data reception. And that's really amazing because when you get the raw IQ data from GPS, you just don't get stupid timing or stupid positioning. You get the whole metrology associated with atomic clocks. Basically, you get here five or six at signals from atomic clocks in space. You get geodesy, you get moisture, um, density in the atmosphere, you get ionosphere, electron density, you get reflection on lakes. Getting this raw data is just a whole field of research open. And if you look in the geophysics uh, field, these people have been doing amazing things with GPS data. I conclude my talk with a selected bibliography. Uh, I'm not going to get through all of these. Half of these books are encouragement for you to get into SDR. It's not technical, it's just stories about Apollo, about Voyager, about uh, um <coughs> Cassini Huygens uh, probes. These are just stories to tell you why uh, software-defined radio is beautiful. And at the end, there is some textbook that you cannot miss. Uh, at some point, you have to get into the maths. But when you get into the maths, because you know what you're doing, and not just for an exam, it's just much more fun. If you're interested, I've written two papers. Uh, the English is a translation of a French article which summarizes all these documents. And if you're interested, just, I'll try to get in the very beginning, um, just send me an email or go to my website. Um, website is over here, email is over here. Feel free to look for the slides on the web and thank you for your attention. I think we have time for a few questions. Two more minutes. One, one, two quick questions. Sorry. Thank you for your nice presentation uh, about your uh, reception of the aircraft data uh, thing. It reminds me very much of how uh, uh, in the old days computers stored their uh, stuff on uh, tape. Basically, that is uh, the synchronous to the carrier frequency, the, the 1224 and about, you encode it. So it would be much easier, I think, to just run a phase, lo phase lock loop and a uh, uh, zero crossing detector over it. The, the, the fun thing about software-defined radio is that you've got so many ways of doing the same thing. And when I presented this to my friends in the lab, they had all their own opinion about how, what is the best way of decoding these sentences. So I'm pretty sure that the PLL would be a beautiful way of doing it, of course, yeah. It would be less computationally expensive. Most probably, indeed, yes. Um, yeah, a actually, le let me emphasize here that what I wanted to do here was to learn how to write my own uh, new radio block. I have not emphasized this enough in this presentation, but the whole point for me was to get the AM data as a sound signal, and I wanted to write my own uh, new radio block to show people how to do it. 
I'm sure there are ways of doing it. And actually, with the new radio blocks available, you can do most things. But I wanted to learn how to new functionalities. Uh, yeah, uh, question. Which hardware is available currently for GNU Radio to uh, demodulate uh, direct sequence spread spectrum Wi-Fi signal? Sorry? Uh, a, a normal DSS uh, Wi-Fi signal. You're asking me if it's available? Yeah, yeah well, which hardware is available for GNU Radio to do that? I believe that based on the bandwidth that you will be needing to get spread spectrum analysis, only the USRP will be doing this. This, this dongle here is able to do GPS because it's 2.8 megahertz sampling rate and GPS is 1.5 or GPS L1 is 1.5 megahertz wide. L2 is 10 megahertz and will not work. <coughs> For Wi-Fi, I'm pretty sure that USRP will do it, but not this simple dongle. Especially because there will not, uh, no, the stupid, stupid answer because this thing will not operate on 2.4 gigahertz. It, it stops at two, so only the USRP will do it. And do you see any pro problems? Because uh, Atos was actually bought by Natural Instruments, I think, a few uh, some time ago. Uh, so I have to probably buy a Natural Instruments box, or, or can you still buy those Atos boxes? I, at least, people from Atos Research have claimed on the new radio mailing list that there would be no interaction or no interference from National Instruments in their selling instruments. How it's going to happen, I don't know. At the moment, I have not seen any difference. But again, I emphasize, for me, there's very two, two very different things. GNU Radio as a framework for digital signal processing and the hardware. HS Research is doing beautiful hardware. There is a flourishment at the moment of new boards. Whether they are equal or not, I cannot say. But And if you believe HS is not good enough, then you can just go for your own, but reuse GNU Radio framework. There's a fan cube, which is also, but the fan cube is the same hardware as this one, but with a slower, higher resolution A2D converter. So it's 96 kilohertz, but 10 or 12 bits. So again, it's a trade-off between whether you want high resolution, uh, low frame rate, or high frame rate, low resolution. Um, the, if you go on my website, jmfry.free.fr, it's the, fir the first link. You will see the OVH uh, link is the first one. OK, thank you. Thank you. We have to set up the next. Please let me just add one more thing. There <coughs> in my lab, if you're interested in this topic, there are PhD and postdoc position funding available. Feel free to contact me if you're interested in PhD or postdoc. There are funding available. Thank you very much.